Um, I uh, want to let you know about the um, the Twitter. Uh, I think you're going to say what it is. Hashtag language, language games. Uh, I think oh. maybe if you use the handle at CPW Blackstreet, you can find the hashtag brings up all the events. So can you explain what that looks like for everybody? Because I don't really use Twitter, which is quite an interesting thing about me. At CCW Grand School, all the one word, yeah? Okay, fantastic. Um, so, um, thank you. Um, I'd like to now um, introduce uh, Mark Koppelberg, who's come in from Vienna to be here with us, and um, is going to talk about language as technology, <coughs> technology as language, which was very nicely um, raised in the earlier presentation. Thank you very much and welcome. Thank you very much, uh, Sina, for the introduction and for inviting me here in London. Um, so, um, maybe it's a good start to say something about um, where I'm coming from. So, <coughs> I'm starting off from philosophy of technology, and then uh, during the past years I'm venturing more and more into domains of art uh, and, and related areas um, to, to try to better understand technology. Uh, so, that's, that's um, my background. And um, before I st <coughs> start the, the presentation about um, using Wittgenstein for philosophy of technology to think about language games uh, and technology, um, I'd like to mention for this community, it might be interesting to know um, that I'm also thinking about um, questions like can machines create art? What is creativity? Um, in this article, I, I link the, the discussions about this question within the technical community to discussions in aesthetics. I um, also have an article about the, the poetry um, of um, uh, innovation, um, where I argue that, that both um, uh, art and, and uh, technological innovation uh, have in common that they are technological practices, and I use the Greek term poiesis, poiesis, to, um, to, uh, to, to develop that argument. So I think all this relates to, to what has been said um, already this morning. Um, now I would like to um, start uh, my, my argument about, about bringing language and, and uh, technology together uh, for philosophy of technology. So what I noticed in, in philosophy of technology, we think a lot about artifacts, about uh, material artifacts, um, technology we find as these, these objects, artifacts. But there's much less um, uh, thinking about language, uh, I would say, especially after the so-called empirical turn in philosophy of technology. Um, and on the other hand, there's philosophy of language, but they are less interested in, in material artifacts. And so um, what, what I want to do is, is to bring these fields closer together and, um, and think about the relation between language and technology. So I started to do that in, in this article and um, in my, my forthcoming book I developed this more. So what I want to do t today is to um, uh, use some terms from Wittgenstein to um, not just to, to add language as a topic to thinking about technology, but to suggest that we can use these terms to actually rethink technology itself um, within philosophy of technology and um, the concepts I will propose are language games and form of life, and that's why um, I think it fits also with, with the, the interest for this um, event. So um, first I will say what I think that Wittgenstein <coughs> means um, by language, how, how he sees language, um, and then uh, I, I will use this, these notions for thinking about technology. So, one important point Wittgenstein makes is that a meaning depends on use, that, that um, signs are, are dead basically unless they are used. Um, I do think this gives, um, this gives by itself some hope for people in artificial intelligence to, to, um, to try to develop machines that can use language um, because they can, can look at human, how humans use uh, language. Um, but things get more complicated soon. Um, interesting in Wittgenstein for me, uh, thinking about technology, is that he compares language to an instrument. 
He says it is an instrument, that uh, concepts also are instruments. Um, and that um, tools uh, um, can be a metaphor for, uh, for words we use. So that the words and concepts we use are instruments, are tools, um, which then have diverse functions. Now, this is not um, the only point I think in which a, a second important point is that in turn, this use of words is embedded in larger holes, in um, what he calls language games and forms of life. Um, and um, I think th this is, is interesting, as, as I will argue, for philosophy of technology to, um, to get towards this more holistic approach. Um, what, what this means is, um, is of course, um, a, a, an important question in, in Wittgenstein's scholarship. Um, for me, I, I connect it with, with culture, um, a, a larger whole as, as a culture, but not culture in the sense of uh, some, some monolithic thing out there, um, apart from the use of language and apart from the way we live our lives. Um, so in that sense, I, I do endorse cultural interpretation. Um, and I also uh, use, a, use a transcendental interpretation by which I mean that um, there are all these meanings already there in our culture. Um, and it's on the basis of these meanings, these meanings make it possible that our speaking becomes meaningful. So there is already a meaning there and uh, so there's something given, one could say, um, and, and on the basis of that, we, um, we use our language, we, we, we do the things we do. Um, and I think this transcendental interpretation for those interested in Wittgenstein is supported by Wittgenstein himself when he says that his inquiry is a grammatical inquiry. So here, grammar is, is not so much used as syntax. We also do that. We put words together and form sentences. We put sentences together and form larger holes like narratives. Um, but uh, there's also grammar in the sense that we, we must already presuppose all kind of meanings in our culture um, and, and this um, makes it possible to say something in the first place that we understand each other um, when, when we, when we uh, talk, when we use speech. Um, so it's, it's, it's a kind of structure um, and uh, one could use the term surface grammar versus depth grammar also to, to develop this. Um, a last point I want to make regarding Wittgenstein is that, that I think that these larger holes, the, the games that structure our language use, the form of life, that they are also have some normativity in, in it. They um, demand, so to speak, uh, that, that, uh, that, that we use certain meaning rather than other. Um, it, it's not a de determination, we are not in, imprisoned in, in language, but it's, it's pretty normative um, in the sense that it's difficult to, to use language in different ways. I will give, uh, soon give examples um, of that in the technology sphere. Um, also, I think sometimes Wittgenstein is interpreted in terms of um, rule following, that, that these, these games means that there are rules, and that's true. But there's also a lot of knowledge we have about language use that is there in implicit ways. Um, that we learn through using language with others, to communicate with others, um, but it's, it's not always easy to make that explicit. So this is, for example, a problem for those people in, in, in technology who want to develop uh, machines that, that can talk, because um, a lot of the meaning um, that we use in everyday language use, um, it, it's very difficult to formalize. Um, if it could be formalized, then, then um, the, the project of the, the, uh, the talking machine would be easier. So <coughs> this was very, very quickly, but it's, it's kind of a toolbox, one could say, for thinking um, about technology now. That's how I, I, how I use it also. So also the concepts I see as, as, as tools. Um, so let's look at, at, at Wittgenstein's metaphor. So basically, he compares um, words to tools, compares language to technology. He's very, very uh, explicit about that. And um, the idea that I had in, uh, for the book was to, to turn around that metaphor and um, to 
try to learn from what Wittgenstein says about language to say something about technology. So how does this look like? Well, first of all, um, it means that um, any kind of technological object um, should, be, should be seen uh, in its use, but also in this larger whole. So not just um, as isolated artifacts, for example, the robot as an art uh, artifact, or, uh, or Amazon's Echo or, or something, uh, that, um, a speaking device uh, as, as, a, as a separate thing. Uh, no, the, 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 the thing is always technically related to larger holes. There's a kind of technological grammar, one could say. There's a network, uh, um, it's really connected to the internet. Um, but it's also in terms of the meaning of, what, uh, of, of the speaking of the machine, um, th that's only possible that, that we sense the meaning um, because uh, the, that use of language uh, by the machine is part of uh, particular activities and games. For example, if we um, were to use these robots more, more uh, frequently and more widely, robots that are now being developed for um, healthcare, um, then, then I think to understand what's happening there, if, if the robot were to use language, is that uh, this language is embedded in a particular game. Here, for example, one could say the, um, giving someone a, a, a cup of tea, uh, serving someone, uh, maybe a bit larger, is, is, a, is a game. Uh, it has certain rules. It's, it, it, it's connected to certain ways we do things as humans. And so if we want to, to um, make the robot do, uh, do certain um, actions and, and uh, use words, uh, then these should be, for, for it to make sense to us, uh, need to be embedded within these uh, larger holes. Here, um, uh, the game of serving, a game of giving coffee. Um, it can be a, a language game connected with, uh, 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 here you are, thank you, and so on. And these language games are slightly different in different contexts and different cultures. It's also a challenge for, for, uh, for roboticists and, and, and people in artificial intelligence. So how can we uh, make sure that, that, um, that the machine fits in a, in a particular uh, cultural context? Um, so there are these rules and activities uh, related to it. Um, and could be also talking about the weather, for example. In a care context, it's not just the, the, the the technical care, so to speak, for example, giving someone a medicine, but there are all kinds of language games uh, connected to that. Uh, having a little chat with someone, um, there, there can be very specific activities and language games that are usually not made explicit um, uh, connected to that, and someone can observe that, for example, by means of ethnographic um, uh, research. And then, if we look at larger holes, I think that there are um, larger structures that, that uh, provide a kind of grammar for these games and for, in the end, these interactions um, and activities and uses of language. Um, so what this means, I think, is that um, in our culture, in our society, there is a kind of grammar of social relations. This is the way we do things in the sense of this is the way we uh, deal with one another. Um, and so the, if a robot has to, to fit in, in society, then it has to learn this. Um, so uh, I, I think if we, if we take into account this uh, holistic, transcendental, normative, and implicit structures and grammars, then um, there's more chance that, that the, the use of technology and the use of language connected with it is meaningful for human beings. Um, let me give some examples of the larger whole called form of life. Um, one, one is gender, so if, if someone designs a robot with a female shape, then this, this design um, and this use of the robot um, is, is connected to an entire um, culture in which um, there are certain ideas about gender, in which there are uh, certain uh, uh, ways of doing things that are contested, in which there is a discourse about gender. and um, so. I think things go wrong when um, people who develop technology, when they neglect 
this larger whole. Um, and, and when, in this case, the, um, the, all the language games and the ways of doing things connected to gender. Um, also, um, here, uh, kicking, kicking a robot, there was this case of, of a company developing a robot and then testing it by kicking it, showing that it can stand on its, on its um, uh, legs, one could say. Um, <coughs> but but pe some people found this uh, problematic, ethically problematic. Like, why do you do this to the robot? Why do you kick it? And I think this, to, to understand this, it's, it's, it's totally uh, incomplete to say that this is just a machine, uh, that this is just a, a, a material artifact. Um, so the only way we can understand this is to connect it to larger games and, and, and to a, a, a whole kind of form of life. In this case, I think uh, it's, it's, we have to connect it with how we treat animals. Someone already remarked, like, we should, we should compare that. Um, uh, I, I, I've done that already because I find it very revealing for uh, to try to understand what's happening here. So I think the people that um, that find find it ethically problematic that this robot is kicked, they they might uh, have this uh, this grammar of uh, relations with animals, how we deal, and and also normatively how we should deal with animals. Uh, you're not supposed to kick a dog, um, and this normativity then uh, leads into the, the relation with the robot. Um, another example is um, discourse about labor and slavery, the way we should do things, should not do things with one another. Um, so um, some people argue, okay, the robots, they, they are, should just serve us. Um, basically, they should be slaves. Sometimes the, the, uh, some people use this word, uh, slave. Now, <coughs> I, I think this, this can also be ethically problematic. And again, to understand this, it's not enough to say like, yeah, but this is just a machine uh, consisting of wires and, and uh, metal and so on. Uh, it's important to uh, link here the, the technological object and the technological system, um, which is now this composite and, and, and grammatical, so to speak, to a larger cultural and social grammar um, in this case, a whole history of labor relations, a whole history of human relations with one another, um, with discourses about slavery, against slavery, um, normative uh, um, uh, areas and tensions. So um, I think that this helps us, this kind of approach, to make sense of what's happening there. And um, it also helps, I think, um, uh, designers and, and developers of technological systems to have a framework um, to take into account more than, than just the, the specific technological object and its interaction with individual uh, human beings. Um, a, a last example I want to give is romanticism. So in my last book, uh, New Romantic Cyborgs, I argued that the, the whole um, uh, romantic uh, discourse from 19th century until now um, it's also something that shapes our, the way we uh, uh, think about technology and the way we use technology. Um, and I saw it also in the presentations uh, this morning. For example, I speak here also about, about the, the, the Gothic um, side of Romanticism. Well, this, this Gothic thinking, um, uh, for example, about ghost spirits and so on, the, the romantic Gothic interests of the 19th century still work in our, the way we we, we deal with technology the way we interpret, for example, um, the very project of uh, making a humanoid robot. Um, so we have this whole history from Frankenstein, uh, Frankenstein's um, so-called monster to today. And I'm not going to say so much about it now, but, um, but it's again trying to, here, here I do more kind of historical cultural exercise to try to reveal in a way this um, th this dimension of our form of life, which is still partly romantic. Um, so I think then what one task for what I see then for um, a phenomenology and hermeneutics of technology is to reveal um, the, the grammars, the, the larger patterns, the gains, um, to, to, to open up this, this larger world. So in, instead of opening uh, 
the black box, so the more in the material side, which has been done by SDS, and it's very interesting and, and, and useful. Um, we need to also go, go, go more um, to, to the outside, so to speak, or to the wider um, holistic uh, structures that uh, shape technology use and uh, technology design. And um, given that there is this normative aspect, I think um, we can also do that in a way that, that is critical, like all the examples I gave um, enable us to take distance from current discourses about technology, to criticize them, um, to bring also all kind of theory that's already there um, uh, in, in uh, gender studies, for example, in disability studies, in animal studies, um, in all kinds of social uh, sciences and humanities, um, uh, and bring that to bear on uh, discussions about artificial intel intelligence, robots, algorithms, and so on. So um, this double task to reveal and to critically reflect can be done, I think, by using these Wittgensteinian notions. Um, it could possibly also be done with other concepts, but I think these concepts um, point very clearly in that direction and, um, and can be used for that purpose. It can be part of, of the toolbox of philosophers of technology, of social scientists, of other uh, um, humanities and social scientists who, who think about technology. So to conclude, um, I responded to um, what I saw as an unnecessary and uh, undesirable uh, gap in philosophy of technology. There was too little thinking about how language and technology connect by using these Wittgensteinian notions and proposed this um, uh, two-fold approach. Um, I think this shows, uh, is, is in the end, meant to show this approach um, uh, not only to, to help us uh, to, for, for thinking about the development of the technology, but, but in the end it also reveals uh, something about our way of life, um, about our entire form of life. And so I think this, goes, this shows again how, um, how the, the arrows go in both directions. When we think about technology, we also always think at the same time about the human. Um, and so um, if, if uh, we want to do humanities, for example, and with, which is clearly in the, in the concept has this, this, this notion of the human, in it, if we want to think about what the human is, what, what humans should become, um, I think it's very important to, uh, to think about technology and vice versa. I think the two are um, very much connected.
um, the transcendental, um, and I'm, I, I find it hard to grasp how his um, use of language or his um, ideas are transcendental. Are you suggesting that um, Wittgenstein's use of language goes beyond the given, or how is it transcendental? Can you say a bit more about that? Yeah. Um, I, I think it's important to distinguish between transcendental and transcendent. So I think it's not transcendent because for, for Wittgenstein, uh, as far as I read, uh, read it, um, he's pointing to, to, um, to language and culture as, as in, in concrete cues and activities. It's not something out there disconnected from our experience and, and our uh, concrete life with, with uh, also technologies and other people. Um, but it, um, transcendental here means um, not lacking trans very abstract categories that make possible our thinking, uh, that, that might be also the case, but very um, uh, st structures that, that are in language, um, that, that, and, and have certain meanings, but that that structure our use of language without that we are always aware of it. But that doesn't mean that they also have this, this kind of um, uh, independent reified existence. They only live in, in use. Um, so for me, these transcendental conditions is not something that we can find uh, in, a, in a highly spectral, speculative way. Um, it can be revealed by, by looking at the use of language and, and um, by, by looking at use of language and in a comparative way also. Um, so it, it's all, in a way, it's all there. If I understand Wittgenstein well, it, it's there open for us to see, but we need to become aware of it.
it's, you, it's descriptive, but it's at the same time there's a normative side to it that, that there's this kind of normative pressure to do things in the way that, that other people do things. And that's in, in this social cultural drama. Thank you very much. We are out of time. I'm going to take a very quick question if you have one, yeah? The back, I'm sorry, I don't know your name. Hi. Um, so I guess one way, but the one thing I think that Wittgenstein kind of said, and Chomsky kind of said, is that a uh, thing about having a language is that you also have to have a mind to have a language. And if that's the case, then when we start talking about machines and technology using or doing or having language, then we also, in at least in Aristotle's way, kind of have to start thinking about machines having minds. Yes, it definitely relates to that question. And then I guess the Wittgensteinian uh, angle on that is to not focus on mental states, but to focus on the use of words and, and not ask the question of mind in the, in the traditional way. Um, and I find it interesting, and I'm, I'm not sure where exactly I stand there in the philosophy of mind side, but it's very interesting to see how, how he tries to put a different question. Um, then, then, like, does uh, I, th I think starting from Wittgenstein, we don't ask uh, what are the mental states of a machine, um, but we, we ask, like, how I think does a machine use language, and how does that then compare with, with humans? And I think we can still make differences there, uh, doesn't mean that we, we equate them. And that's interesting, it connects to previous arguments I've done, like that we should look at the phenomenology, the, the appearance of machine and uh, in the interaction with the human. Thank you very much. Um, that leads me to think about how Wittgenstein might approach um, um, your sandbox. But, uh, I think Wittgenstein discussion. actually said <laughs> that the statement that a machine thinks is a complete impossibility. <laughs> it's a totally illogical statement.